spanning tree protocol is a loop prevention mechanism. Let me say that again. Spanning tree protocol is a loop prevention mechanism or a loop control mechanism. What spanning tree does by default is it manages what would eventually happen in an environment without any kind of management protocol relative to managing the redundancy. And I know that's a lot of said, but let me let me put that into a perspective. In any kind of network element, we typically have three planes of operation. We have what's called a data plane, which is actually forwarding our data frames throughout the network. And we also have a control plane, which is done inside of the switches intelligence. And then we have a management plane, which is where we engage in the switch and we actually manage it. So we use the management plane to effectively manage the control plane, which manipulates or um, influences the way that the device is actually forward traffic. Without spanning tree protocol, um, what we would have in the data plane is we would have continued frame duplication, again, without any kind of a mechanism to control it. We would have multiple frame transmissions and multiple frames being delivered, which can be problematic for our endpoints down here. In the control plane, as it relates to the switch's knowledge of how to forward frames and how to learn about where MAC addresses live and the port associations with those MAC addresses, we would actually have MAC database instability. In other words, the MAC database would continue to change as the Ethernet frames traverse the network over and over and over again. This creates a phenomenon known as a broadcast storm. In effect, what a broadcast storm, let me just kind of draw that here really quickly, a broadcast storm is where if this device were to send a broadcast frame into the switch and this device were belonging to VLAN 2, what the switch would actually do is the switch would flood that out of all interfaces that are carrying traffic for VLAN 2. And it would come up here. And then, of course, this switch, uh, being a part of VLAN 2, would simply repeat that broadcast. And you'll notice that what happens here is that when, it, when that broadcast reaches this switch, this switch would then repeat that going out here and, going, and coming back down here. So uh, what this caused, this ca eventually this causes a broadcast storm in the sense that you've got all of this traffic going around and around and around, and it literally starts to look like a tornado. What also happens is the processor becomes overloaded, and it functionally can't operate the switch. Um, uh, it, it functionally can't operate within the switches um, in, in the event of this storm. So. <clears throat> We need a mechanism that effectively, uh, that effectively manages that phenomenon. Spanning tree is the thing that actually provides that loop avoidance mechanism. And it does this uh, in a couple of different ways. I think it's important to note that there are several kinds of spanning tree protocol, some that are Cisco proprietary and some that are just standards-based proprietary standards-based mechanisms. So the original spanning tree protocol was published back in 1990, and it was also known as what was called common spanning tree. And what that meant was that for all the switches in this environment, you would have one spanning tree instance for all configured switches and all configured VLANs. Uh, and that was called common spanning tree, or 802.1b. Another type of spanning tree that followed that was called rapid spanning tree protocol, and the primary difference between, and we'll, we'll talk more about this as we talk about Cisco's implementation of both of these, is that uh, with rapid spanning tree protocol, there was a need to actually reduce the amount of time that it took to have the switches come into what was called a converged state. And a converged state effectively means that, uh, that all the switches are aware of one another. They have established their forwarding paths with regard to VLANs. They have, uh, they, and they are now just sharing their timer mechanisms with one another to manage the redundancy within the architecture. Another type of spanning tree is what's called multiple spanning tree or MST. Multiple spanning tree gives us the ability to effectively map, for lack of a better way of saying it, multiple VLANs to an instance of spanning tree. 
And then 802.1p uh, gave us some additional quality of service mechanisms that we could implement into uh, spanning tree instance so that we would have, so that we could uh, give higher priority to our traffic flows um, as it related to voice versus data traffic or real-time versus non-real-time traffic. Now, in the, Cisco, uh, in the Cisco sphere or in the Cisco ecosystem, Cisco implemented what was called per VLAN spanning tree plus, which is based on common spanning tree or 802.1D. And then they also introduced rapid per VLAN spanning tree plus, which is similar to the 802.1W protocol or uh, rapid uh, spanning tree protocol. When switches become aware of each other, the first thing that the first thing that happens is they start to exchange what are called bridge protocol data units. And a bridge protocol data unit is a data package that effectively says, "Hey, I'm a switch. Uh, you need to need you need to know that I'm here, and um, and we need to figure out how we're going to operate uh, given any future eventuality of redundant connections between us." And so, switches uh, by default, and I think it's important to note that in uh, at least in the Cisco ecosystem. Spanning tree protocol or Cisco's implementation of spanning tree protocol called PBST plus is enabled by default. Okay, so <clears throat> what's going to happen here is switch A and switch B are going to become aware of one another, but initially until they figure out who the who the lead switch in the architecture is going to be for the purposes of managing spanning tree protocol, each of them is going to assume that they have a primary role in terms of being what's called the root bridge or the root switch. Those are in, in, inter, inter-exchangeable terms that we use in spanning tree protocol. So um, the, uh, the process that they follow uh, to do that is they are both going to send out what are called bridge protocol data units, or BPDUs for short, that effectively say, I am the root for all configured VLANs in this architecture. What's then going to happen is each of them is going to process those bridge protocol data units from each other. And again, they're both going to say, I am the root. In other words, I am the reference point for all configured VLANs and for managing the redundant links between us. What's then going to happen is based on what's called a bridge ID, which is a concatenated value of switch priority and base MAC address, one of those is going to actually win that election process as it relates to the spanning tree protocol. It's important to note that the switch with the lowest priority and base MAC address, priority of course is configurable, and base MAC address actually becomes the root bridge or the root switch or the reference point for the redundancy in the network. You'll notice here that switch A has a priority of 32768, which is the default priority in Cisco switches, and it has a base MAC address starting with 0011. You'll also notice over here that switch B has the same priority as a default value, uh, and it has a MAC address starting with the values of AA. If translated into numeric values, AA actually stands for 1010. So we know mathematically that 1010 is a higher value than 00. So for that reason, switch A becomes the root bridge of the topology. Now there's a whole process of blocking, listening, learning, and then convergence that takes place as these switches navigate or negotiate who the root bridge is going to be. So inevitably what happens is switch A becomes the root bridge because it has the lowest concatenated bridge ID. Now, what then happens is during the timer process, what's going to take place is switch B is gonna say, okay, what is my topological relationship with switch A? And switch B is gonna say, okay, I've got two interfaces connected to switch A, and, and of course switch A and switch B would again be aware of one another, and, and switch B would be aware that it has two physical connections topologically to switch A, and for that reason, it is going to say, okay, I've got two possible pathways to get traffic to the reference point for 
this spanning tree instance, and it's going to select one of those ports as what's called the root port, and another one will just remain in a blocked state. The reason for the blocked state right here, let me just kind of bring some attention to this. The reason for the blocked state right here is because this is actually what's preventing that whole phenomena of broadcast storms going on between switch A and switch B. Then uh, switch B is going to say, okay, what is the lowest cost path going back to the root switch? And so right here, you'll notice that the lowest cost path, in this case, becomes the root port. The other thing worth mentioning is that whoever becomes the root bridge or the root switch, in the root switch, all ports become designated and all of them eventually converge into a forwarding state. It's important to note that depending on the actual physical connection speed between switch A and switch B, that's how the switch is going to determine which port becomes root and which port stays in the block state. It's important to note that different instances of spanning tree actually have different cost mechanisms. The, uh, the, the four that I want to kind of make you aware of are the uh, 802.1D costs, uh, which basically say that, so in standard spanning tree, a 10 megabit link has a cost of 100. So if this, if this interface right here happened to be an ethernet interface, a 10 megabit per second link, its cost to get to switch A would have been 100. But because it's a fast ethernet, it has a cost of 19. If it had been a one gigabit ethernet link connecting the two switches, it would have had a cost of four. And if it were a 10 gigabit link, it would have had a cost of two. So effectively what happens between switch A and switch B in this case is that because this is a fast ethernet link and this is also a fast ethernet link, then the switch port with the actual, with the lowest uh, nomenclature actually becomes the root and the fast Ethernet 01, which is one higher than fast Ethernet 00, become or stays in the block state. Now, what's going to happen is, is these switches are going to exchange bridge protocol data units. That's going to continue. And, um, and should there be a change in the topology, switch B would have to recalculate its relationship with switch A in the event of a link failure. So it's important to note that just because a port is in a block state doesn't mean that it's turned off. It simply means that it is blocking the redundancy in the, in the process. Now, as it relates to the way that bridge protocol data units and timers are all exchanged, I think it's also important to note that this whole process can take up to 50 seconds. So again, as switches become aware of each other and as they start exchanging bridge protocol data units, Everybody starts in a blocked state. And we're going to talk about kind of here at the, towards the tail end of this presentation, how that, some of that can actually be uh, mitigated from a timer perspective. We're going to talk about that. So everybody starts in block. So effectively, as switches become aware of each other, they all start in a block state. And, um, and they will stay that way for a period of up to 20 seconds. They will then transition into what's called a listening state. So now they're, now they're uh, taking all these bridge protocol data units in the topology and they're listening to those and they're processing those through the spanning tree algorithm. They will then take another 15 seconds to learn and that is when the decision is made about who is the root, uh, what ports are gonna remain in the block state and which ports are gonna go into the designated state or in the forwarding state. So there's a whole 50 second timer that actually uh, takes place in the standard instance of spanning tree. And that includes the way that Cisco implements it. So what's now gonna happen now that all of that timer stuff has taken place, switch A becomes the root bridge. In switch A, both of the ports go into a designated state, which means that they are forwarding traffic for any particular VLAN in the architecture. Switch B, transitions fast Ethernet 00 into a root port designation, which is also a forwarding port, and it leaves FA01 in a blocked state to again prevent loops within the switched architecture. 